we are uh, going to talk about more small phage, and I brought my extra bags of tricks here. Um, these are really, really small. This particular printed model is pretty close to a million times life size for Phi X174, which also gives you a bit of an idea how very, very small virions are, because if that's a million times life size, just think what you would be like if you were a million times the size that you are now. So um, that gives you a bit of an idea. And in fact, those are the particular the Phi X174. That's the one that I had the tube full of 10 to the 11th particles thereof. So it's a bit of an idea. Here's a slightly larger version um, here that I 3D printed. <clears throat> but before we talk about that, I um, did want to briefly review small RNA phage of where did we find them, the small RNA phage? Best place to find bacteriophage? Sewage treatment plants, or at least wastewater. Uh, the structures of them, they, first people thought they had these nice icosahedrally symmetric structures. What was wrong about that? Why were they not completely icosahedral? Yeah, they had the maturation protein at one, one vertex. And why, why did people think that they were symmetrical, but they weren't? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it was the averaging and the, the process that they used for the averaging, which just averaged out that one uh, vertex. Turns out that for these guys, um, these were drawn with X-ray crystallography, and the averaging there, there were actually there was no averaging that needed to take place. So actually, these really are completely symmetric, which brings up some interesting issues that we'll talk about a little bit later on. As far as these RNA viruses, true for all of the RNA viruses, but really well understood for these small RNA viruses like MS2 and Cubeta. It's all about translation versus replication and how you control the amounts of the proteins. And so it's all those secondary structures, how you had association of the ribosome, and it's the association of the ribosome with the start codons, which really leads to how you have more or less of any particular protein. We'll talk also quite a bit about the same issue for 5 174 and this is a DNA virus, you still need to make a lot more of some proteins and a lot less of other proteins. And so how you go about doing that is also an interesting regulatory issue that, again, we'll talk about for lots of different viruses. And being a DNA virus, clearly it's a very different process. So there's some translation, mostly here it's transcriptional regulation that we'll be talking about. And then really briefly, we talked about biotechnology and what's sort of the big reason that people like the proteins from RNA phage for biotechnology applications. Why was that? Big, huge picture-wise. Any thoughts? Should I throw the throw the virion at anybody? Um, this has to do with the uh, yeah. Oh, sorry, passed along there, Greg. It's not so much targeting the specific proteins, but what is it about the RNA viruses and that's special about? So particularly the replicase protein. So RNA viruses do what? What do they make more copies of? Yeah, so RNA and an RNA template, and so amplifying RNA. So the real key here is the way to amplify RNA. Um, and that's why the Q-beta polymerase is being heavily used for that. So any more questions about these, um, the small RNA viruses of bacteria? The RNA phage. Okay, so we'll talk about now the <clears throat> small bacteria phage. Again, the, these are also known as the microviruses. Um, where they came from, um, I actually went to see if it was actually wastewater. Probably was, but still not absolutely certain. Was looking for that. Apparently, people were just looking for lots of viruses that infected E. coli and just finding a whole bunch of different ones. And these ones happen to be really, really small. And so that's why they're called the, the microviruses. This turns out to be a great tool. We talked about the small RNA viruses would be great tools for making RNA. This, of course, is a great tool for making that other kind of nucleic acid, um, the DNA. And partly because of that, it's been one of the best studied 
probably viruses at all, um, of really bacterial viruses, archaeal viruses, eukaryotic viruses, you know, who cares about those, um, et cetera, and mostly because of replication. So thinking about how replication takes place, a lot of the discoveries in terms of how DNA is replicated at all, DNA polymerases, many of them are found using the DNA from these microviruses. Assembly turns out to be a really fascinating process. And so you might want to think, you think about it, okay, these are your nice small virions, maybe they're really easy to put together. Um, turns out they're really very complicated in the process of how you fit together these microviruses. So we'll, we'll spend a while talking about that. And that's also some of the things that are not, in fact, in our textbook. A lot of the stuff has been published actually since um, our textbook was put together. And then finish up a little bit with some diversity, which is a rather egotistical plug for some of the stuff that my lab has been doing. Um, we'll talk about some of the microvirus sequences that we've discovered in some extreme environments. And if you're interested in the extreme environments, ask Diana because she's been there. Um, so <clears throat> what's the big picture? Um, again, no, single-stranded DNA phage. Just the whole idea of packaging a single strand inside your virion is really kind of strange because if you have a single-stranded, what, what can a cell do with single-stranded DNA? Yeah, chop it up, right. Is that useful if you're a virus? No, not terribly. <laughs> so what's the very first thing that has to happen if you have a single-stranded genome? If you're going to use cellular processes, what has to happen? You have to get a separate strand. And so you're absolutely dependent on making that second strand, which seems like kind of a really strange way to go about replicating your genome. Um, now, it may be because you know, smaller is better. So it just turns out, you now if you've got one strand, it's easier to package than having two strands. So, but that I think is a really open and interesting question, and we'll talk more about it when we talk about some of the other work that my lab does when George Kaysen gives his lecture on single-stranded DNA viruses that infect eukaryotes uh, as well um, later on. Okay, entry. Uh, again, this is a brand new, relatively speaking anyway, just last year there was another publication that came out on entry for these um, microviruses. It gets sort of the point of, as you mentioned, for the... the RNA viruses, they've got one specific vertex, which is different. Well, these have 12 that are all the same. And so how do you then go about 12 being all the same and binding and then getting entry to take place? Because they're also infecting E. coli. Two membranes actually relatively tough to get through them. And so that process we've learned quite a bit about in the last couple of years. Replication, you know, why single strands are really bizarre. Um, you do have to end up as a double-stranded form. That's also known as the replicative form of the viral genome. So very first step that has to happen, you have to form double-stranded. Once you have double-stranded DNA, then you also have to go back to make single-stranded DNA. So there's also this whole, you know, we're double-stranded, we're single-stranded, uh, bouncing back and forth. And so there must be some kind of pretty strong evolutionary force saying that, you know, single-stranded is a better way to go rather than just sticking around with double-stranded DNA. And then, as I mentioned before, um, assembly, Pretty unique, actually, for these viruses that I know of is that they not only have an internal scaffolding protein, but they also have an external scaffolding protein. So when we talked about assembly last time, um, the time before, actually, then the scaffolding proteins, these are proteins that are important for assembly of the virion, but are no longer present in the virion at the end. They're almost always going to be on the inside of the virus or the virion particle. But in this case, you also have some external ones as well. So we'll, uh, we'll look at that. So again, these are the big picture thing is sort of great to go back and think about as of what's happening next Monday. Next Monday? All happy about next Monday? Yes? Be coming to my office hours, sending lots of questions? Good. OK, so <clears throat> microviruses, small. Again, um, so I've got, so where's my other advantage? So this guy is um, SSV1, which is actually to exactly the same scale as the FIX-174. So gives you a bit of an idea how much smaller these virions are than some other ones. And most of the ones that I have in green here are going to be of the same scale. This is adenovirus, um, also at the same scale. So it gives you a bit of a, an idea what, what kind of things we're, we're thinking about. So they're small. 
Um, and these were found, in fact, literally just by looking at filters, you know, running them through filters. <clears throat> Best studied of these is FIX-174, which infects E. coli. And then there are a number of other microviruses that infect close relatives of these gram negatives. But more recently, people have found that there are quite a lot of microviruses that infect some cells, things like Bedellovibrio and Chlamydia. Um, many of these, Spiroplasma, these are bacteria that infect bacteria. So you sort of have a virus that's infecting a bacterium that's infecting a bacterium, or in the case of chlamydia, um, one which is infecting eukaryotic cells. So it's this whole sort of Russian doll idea that you have the cell infecting the cell, the virus infecting the cell that infects the cell, um, et cetera. And then um, many, many more, again, through this whole process of metagenomics. But we'll mostly talk about FIX-174. FIX-174. 5,386, no, I don't expect you to remember that number, but about 5,000 bases of DNA is a single-stranded DNA genome, and single-stranded, I should probably put in quotes. When I say single-stranded quotes, what does that really mean? There's some kind of secondary structure, exactly. So <clears throat> this was the very first genome sequence to be solved, partly because people had been studying this virus for quite a long time. Uh, 1977, it was really the development of didioxy chain, ter chain terminator sequencing, also known as Sanger sequencing, which was used to sequence this whole genome. A lot of the early work done on X174 was by a researcher by the name of Robert Sinsheimer, passed away two years ago at the ripe old age of 97. Um, the reason that I mention this is not so much that I'm going to ask you that particular question on the exam, but uh, this building up here in the corner um, is a research lab at UC Santa Cruz named for Sinsheimer. It's like, wow, you can work on you know, DNA replication of viruses and get buildings named after you. Um, so we're hoping, you know, the Stedman building, we're waiting on that for PSU. Uh, but <clears throat> this, the, the basic idea here, this was really very early days, so 77, the uh, 60s, it was really all about trying to get a handle on the fundamentals of how DNA replication works, how you have, you know, for that even matter, isn't that DNA is the genetic material was not much earlier than that. Um, using these viruses as ways to figure out sequencing. And so why would you be so interested in this? This is kind of like what we talked about before as far as the small RNA phage. Why would, why would you want to work with these viral genomes if you're trying to figure out how DNA polymerization works and genetic code and so on and so forth? What would be a good reason to do that? And Mika can throw the virion at somebody. <laughs> Whoever's next. Okay, who well, I'll put on the spot next. Um, Chris Hagerman, did we hit you last time? Okay, not, you haven't been throwing the virion yet? <laughs> so why, why is the, toss the virion over. Oh, coming in, oh, <laughs> behind you. <laughs> See, this is, this is why they're plushies and not, <laughs> not solid. If we threw these, it would be much less fun. <laughs> Better at catching them. <clears throat> so why, why would you want to have these you know, small DNA viruses if you really wanted to know about DNA replication, polymerases, et cetera? Yep, small and easy to work with. What's another reason? Small and easy to work with, yes. Replication. replication. This turns out these replicate really fast, but why is replication time important? Why would you want to have a, something with a fast replication time? So you're talking, we're talking about in vitro studies now, just you know, purified, purified DNA. Why, why would a small virus like this be really useful? As opposed to you know, human genome or human DNA or something like that, or fish DNA. Potentially, that's that's one idea. What what else? What about getting back to that whole idea? So toss the toss the virion back. 
Yes, that's, that's also certainly a, a possibility. But what I was really looking for is, is also kind of what we talked about last time. What's, what's what, I, what I have in that tube when I, when I, put, I had that first lecture? I like 10 to the 11th PFUs, right? So you can get a lot of DNA that's identical. And so that's really the key to this, is making sure you've got enough of the nucleic acid, but it's completely homogeneous. And a lot of the techniques, particularly in the 60s and 70s, were not very sensitive. So having a really nice homogeneous amount of lots and lots and lots of DNA was incredibly useful. Um, and really what allowed a lot of this to be, um, <clears throat> to be used. The other thing which was really neat was that this particular virus DNA was shown to be infectious. And so you just literally take the DNA, if you take that DNA, you put it into E. coli, and there are a number of different ways of doing that, then it will cause the formation of virions. So it's just, just the DNA. Just the DNA coming in was all you needed in order to get more virions. And then, because it was so much fun, uh, people then now, instead of purifying the DNA from the virus, it turns out that they could synthesize the DNA either with a DNA polymerase or, in 2003, literally just by buying individual chemically synthesized pieces of DNA and pop them into a cell, you get a virus, which was um, really cool in some ways. And also people found it a little bit scary that you can literally buy all of the pieces online and then put them together and make a virus. Now, if, you were, if I were E. coli, I'd be really, really scared because you know, these things blast apart E. coli. They don't cause us any problem. But there's some definite um, ethical issues having to do with all of these that we won't talk too much about here. But people are interested, we can talk about that later on. Oops. So, <clears throat> so let's look at what happens when you have this particular piece of DNA. As I mentioned, you, know, you can just literally take the DNA and put it. You know, this, this thing is not working the way it's supposed to. Eh. This is not showing up on here. I'll stop it and start it again. OK, <clears throat> sorry about that. See, all these wonderful technology things. So <clears throat> you get the DNA that comes inside the cell. Um, virion releases it. We'll talk about this process in just a second. Positive strand, single-stranded DNA has to get copied into double strands. Once you have double-stranded DNA, all of the cellular machinery can transcribe it into RNA which can then get translated into proteins. Some of these proteins are going to be involved in replication. Some of these proteins are going to be involved in making more virions. And then after going around a couple of rounds of replication where you go from double-stranded DNA to double-stranded DNA, then you can <clears throat> shift over to making positive strands, single-strand DNA. That then gets packaged into virions and these virions are released. So what does that genome itself actually look like? So here's the genome, um, also known as an extraterrestrial genome. And we'll talk about why that is in, in just a second here. Um, again, this was the very first genome sequence to be performed. And when they did the genome sequencing, what they found was actually very, very strange. And that particular strangeness had to do with the fact that many of the open reading frames were overlapping with each other. And so that overlapping open reading frames was something that nobody really expected. And so in this particular case right here, one part of the genome, all three of the open reading frames are actually being used to make proteins, at least two of which are important for the virus function. So not only do you have a really small capsid in your virion, you also have an extremely efficient use of the open reading frames. A couple of things that you can notice also immediately from the genome. The first one is that this half is the one that has all of the overlapping open reading frames, and this half does not have overlapping open reading frames. So why are overlapping open reading frames not usually thought to be something that is useful or used very much. Where did the virion go? So, back here. Um, 
Megan? Megan here? Nope. Um, Melissa's not here. Angelica? Angelica, sorry. I, I will try to remember Angelica. So, <clears throat> what, why, why is open, so pass the, pass the virion? <laughs> so why, why are overlapping open reading frames not usually thought to be used? Yeah, so what do you mean by easily mutated? I, I, that's exactly right, but I don't want to try and bore down a little bit of that. Okay, not so much replicating. What about re reading frames? Reading frames are important for what aspect? Just a second. Yeah. So there are three overlapping reading frames. So why, 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 why do we say three? What's the three about? Yeah, well, so it's, it, it's all about coding sequence. And so if you change, say, the middle nucleotide here, if you have an open wrapping reading frame, that would actually potentially change three different proteins. But if it's just one, it's only going to change one. So it's actually really strange that you would have overlapping open reading frames. And people had already thought about this before. They knew the genetic code before they sequenced the genome. And it's like, wait a minute. We thought we didn't have overlapping open reading frames, and now we do. But what does that mean about the proteins that are overlapping each other? Okay, well, you mentioned mutations. So what do you mean, what do you think about? Yeah, so it'd be frame shift mutations, although this in case it's just going to be a, a, a change in one nucleotide is going to change then potentially two or even three different amino acids. So if you have open reading frames that are actually coding for different proteins, and those proteins are being used, what does it mean about the sequence of those proteins? Uh, they have to be perfect all the time, or what's the flip side? They have to be perfect, or yeah, they don't have to be perfect. So it turns out that they're actually really mutation tolerant, these particular proteins, if they're overlapping with each other. And so if you have overlapping open reading frames, Usually that means that at least one, if not both, of the proteins that you make there are going to be really mutation tolerant. And that's exactly what's true. So it turns out particularly this protein here, the B protein, is incredibly mutation tolerant. And as we'll see a little bit later on, you can actually completely get rid of it. The virus is much better having that protein, but um, you can change almost the whole thing. Um, this A star protein is also one which is not essential. The A protein, as we'll talk about a little bit later, does turn out to be. The other thing about all of these proteins up here is these are all of the non-structural proteins. So we haven't talked so much about non-structural and structural proteins. We're going to talk a lot about it as we move on through the course. So structural are going to be the ones that are important for the virion, either scaffolding or the actual virion itself. Those, you'll notice down here, do these have overlapping open reading frames? Uh -uh. What does that probably mean about them, though? We just talked about the ones overlapping are mutation tolerant. So these are likely to be what? So mutation tolerant overlapping, non-overlapping means less tolerant, exactly. So non-overlapping areas are less tolerant, which makes sense. You know, this is a structure, and so these structures are probably going to be something which is you know, pretty serious in terms of having to have the conserved amino acids that are associated with them. Um, and it does turn out to be the case, and then these other ones. Um, some of these extra open reading frames are actually really kind of interesting. Um, people talk about where genes come from, you know, how genes are invented. And some theories are is that if you just use a different open reading frame and you can be a little flexible in terms of your mutations in that particular protein, maybe a way you can make new genes. And then if you have a gene duplication that happens, then one will be maintained and the other one can mutate. And so that you can end up with new functions by making just overlapping reading frames as a way to invent new genes. Now, interesting theory of whether it's actually true or not is, is still an open question. Um, we'll talk more about um, transcription a little later on, but I just wanted to particularly mention this. And partly because of this you know, really weird overlapping open reading frames, that was the, the New York Times article about you know, examining tiny viruses for messages from outer space. And at first, like, what, a, what the heck? You know, 
viruses, messages from outer space, I think it's actually not such a crazy idea. So if you think about you know, our planet, um, mostly what? Water, exactly. And what's mostly in the water, other than viruses? <laughs> is it sharks? Is it fish? Bacteria. So if you wanted to send a message, you're going to send a really small amount of information. Wouldn't it be great if you had something that could amplify itself? And amplify itself potentially in something which is really common? So that would be a potential way to have this. And the fact that these are open reading frames that are overlapping is like, no, you're not going to have overlapping open reading frames. There's like no way that it's not going to happen because you can't have these mutations. Much later, people showed that you could have all these mutations and, and have them work. And so that was sort of the idea was that it was, uh, and I've got the whole article um, hanging up in my office, and I think I actually posted it on D2L as well. It's really not a completely crazy idea, even though it may sound like one um, from this point of view. So. <clears throat> Why do you think this would be a um, potential good mechanism for, for outer space? Am I happy to answer a clicker question on this? Because I just told you what the answer was. You can rewind the recording. Get it? Okay, so the Phi X174 genome was thought to be a message from outer space because that overlapping reading frames, it was a single stranded DNA virus. It was found in high altitude lakes. There are lots of microviruses on Earth. It was the first whole genome to be sequenced. people here today? Five, four. Stop. I remember to stop each time before I shared the results. 74%. Um, I think that's close enough. Um, lots of microviruses on Earth. Um, yes, there are, but that's probably not why it would be a message from outer space. <coughs> so I like A. Hopefully you do as well. Any more questions about that? Whether A is reasonable or not? OK. <clears throat> so let's <clears throat> talk about the things that are in that genome. Uh, Mention the you know, overlapping open reading frames. Uh, these are you know, 10 open reading frames here in the viral genomes. I don't expect you to remember all 10, but the ones that I put little red lines underneath, they might be good ones to remember. Um, so <clears throat> first one, the A protein. We'll get back to this a little bit later on. This is the protein which is absolutely critical for DNA replication. It's not a DNA polymerase, but it's critical for getting that single-stranded DNA late, excuse me, later on in order for making your genome that will end up being packaged. The B protein, internal scaffolding protein um, that you have to have for this morphogenesis process. We'll talk about the procapsid um, a little bit later on. This is the one that is incredibly mutable. You can just change it a whole bunch. D is an external scaffolding protein, also highly mutable, also necessary for putting all this together. And then the H protein, which is a pilot protein, which is really weird in terms of the structure. And then so those are the, I think the four sort of critical ones that I consider fair game in terms of putting on a midterm. So what about the structure? So this is, um, I think, a rather beautiful structure. This is the actual virion, is what you see outside the cells. Um, all of the proteins are arranged in a T equals one icosahedrally symmetric form. So that just basically means each of these pentagons around the outside 
um, will fit together right next to the next pentagon, right next to the next pentagon. Um, it's not completely um, quasi-symmetric because there are multiple different proteins that are present on the outside. And they're actually kind of stacked on top of each other. The major part, and again, ignoring these projections at the five-fold axis, is the F protein. And there's 60 of those, exactly as you expect for a regular you know, T equals one icosahedron. Stacked on top of that at the five-fold axes are the G protein. So these guys represent the G protein up here, stacked on top of the F protein. And then on the inside, there's a protein also arranged in icosahedral symmetry, which is a DNA binding protein. So F, G, and J, all the same amounts. There's one other protein left. If you remember the genome, I should have thrown it up here, um, which is also a structural protein. And this is the pilot protein, that, the H protein, which is you know, 10 to 12 copies. So if it had 12 copies, where would you expect it to be? 12 copies of a particular protein, where are you going to expect it to be? Thinking about icosahedral symmetry. Yeah, exactly. The five-fold axis of symmetry. You expect one at each of those five-fold axes of symmetry. Um, turns out that's actually completely wrong. Uh, but it's a great guess, and that's what everybody thought. <laughs> um, so we'll get back to the, the H protein um, a little bit later on. But before we talk about the H protein, um, we really have to talk briefly about Ben Fain, um, who's a professor at the University of Arizona, um, also involved with the Biosphere Institute. Um, and he's really the person who has been working on 5 174 for probably about the last 10, maybe almost 20 years now. Uh, and he's also the author of the chapter um, in the textbook about um, these microviruses. Um, he's really been involved in the understanding of the assembly, how these particles get put together, and then more recently in terms of how they actually enter the cell. First question, of course, is what do they bind to? Um, turns out that they bind to lipopolysaccharide. And lipopolysaccharide is these, you know, LPS also um, can be a real major problem for sepsis. Um, then you have a bacterial infection um, on the outside of the cell. And it turns out that these guys, um, and particularly, not surprisingly, what's sticking out at the outside, um, these G proteins, the spike proteins, these bind to LPS. Um, and particularly the glucose molecule that's part of the LPS. The next question is how do you get the genome out? Once you have the binding here at our five-fold axis of symmetry, how do you have the metastable state? Or remember, it's, it's, these are all now nice and compacted. Um, this, actually, the, the virion itself is just about the same diameter as the distance between the two inner and outer membranes that you would have on E. coli. So how do you get the genome out of this and then into the host cell? For a long time, this was a, a real mystery in terms of how it happened until, I think it was about four or five years ago, well, a little longer than that, yeah, 2013, so six years ago, when Ben Fain, together with Michael Rossman, finally figured out the structure of this H protein. So remember, you know, H protein, there are 12 of them. They're going to be underneath each of the, you know, the five-fold axis of symmetry. Actually, no. They all form together and make this really kind of unique pore structure, which is all alpha helical, um, 10 members here, which then wrap around each other and literally will make a hole. So wait a minute. Where do you fit a hole into one of these particles? So what seems to happen is after you have this interaction we have with the LPS, then somehow, and it's still not entirely clear how, all of these H proteins get together and basically invert themselves through the membrane on the other side. You know, talk about a crazy conformational change that happens is you know, these, and they do seem to be packaged as you know, short peptides. We're not entirely sure where they are inside the cell, but then form these really elongated forms here. How do we know this? Um, this was in some tomography experiments, again, published about six years ago. Um, a little hard to see here, but these are the individual FIX-174 particles up here. This bright one still has its genome in it. These lighter ones no longer have genomes. And if you look really closely, you can see this 
basically tail that is formed here going through first the outer membrane and then finally getting to the inner membrane in order to be able to release the genome through. So again, the diameter of the virion is just about the same as the distance across this whole membrane. And so somehow this H protein has this you know, crazy conformational change that can just push its way through both membranes of E. coli and allow it to get out. So this is the cartoon form. We'll talk about the assembly a little bit later on at the top here. Um, but down at the bottom, we've got interaction with LPS, then this crazy conformational change where the H proteins form this pore, and then the single-stranded DNA comes out down here at the bottom. This is that high-resolution structure for that pore. And one of um, Ben Fain's ideas, it kind of looks like a lamprey. Um, but if you look at the individual amino acids that are sticking out, basically they stick out in such a way that the, the DNA can only go in one direction. It can't go back inside the capsid. And so it just sort of seems to be being pushed out, potentially just diffusion. And a little bit comes out, and it can't go back. So a little bit more comes out, et cetera. And then you start to have second strand um, DNA synthesis and eventually get the whole of your single-stranded DNA first and then double-stranded DNA um, present here inside the cell. Um, this portion right here where you have this, you know, first the G protein interacts with LPS and then somehow this opens up enough so that the H protein can get through. This was still a bit of a mystery until last year when again uh, Michael Rossman and Ben Fain together did some cryo-electron microscopy now using the same kinds of tools that they used for those RNA phages we talked about last time. Instead of having icosahedral symmetry, now you can average and having one of the vertices be a little bit different. And they put them together just with LPS. And what they could see was the virus particles associated with the LPS at one of these <clears throat> five-fold axes of symmetry, and that then opened up, and this opening is presumably then enough to allow the H protein out to be able to then form this pore across the two membranes. Um, and this is the, the cryo-EM, maybe a little hard to see here. Each of these boxes represent one of these particles, which they then average together to get these um, structures right here. One of the things they were able to find was that these had more electron density and so these were then assumed to be the full particles, and these had less electron density, and they were empty particles. The way that they could do this is they have lots of mutants, and some mutants which have problems releasing their genome. And so if you have a mutant that can't release its genome, it looks like this. You have a, a wild type which can release its genome, it looks a little bit like this. Hard to tell, but this one is actually a little bit smaller. It seems to be shrunken relative to that one. And then also if you look on the inside, you can see that this one has density all the way through the virion. This one is actually missing density about right here, which is probably where that H protein was, sitting underneath one of the axes, the fivefold axis of symmetry, rather than on all of them. Yeah? So, the phase that we talked about last time yeah. had the one natural generator mm -hmm. that um, allowed the DNA to find out exactly where it was going to mm -hmm. RNA. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How does it know where it's going to be for which one? Right. So the, the, the question is, how does it know which one of these axes to use? Um, and the answer is, we don't know. <laughs> um, it may be that's also where the H protein is hanging out on the inside. There's only one area where H protein is hanging. Yeah. Well, the inside of the, the virion, it's actually very hard to tell because we don't have a high enough resolution structure to see that H protein. And actually, probably because of that, it means that it's actually kind of floating around in different places. Yeah, so it's exactly. not always the same place. But it only assembles once you have this kind of interaction that takes place. Um, and so it appears that it could be any of those Gs, the spike proteins here, which could interact. And it's only after you have that interaction, then you get the H protein there, and then it makes that, that change. There is no extra protein, again, which is specific at any one of those particular vertices. So unlike the case for the small RNA phage, where you did have that maturation protein, that one of the, um, the five-fold axes here you don't. 
Okay, so this is what they think is going on now. Basically, it's sort of an extension of that. You have each of these, oops, pardon me, each of these, here we go. Uh, each of these spike proteins are going to interact with LPS. After they've interacted with LPS, then that guy will open up at that particular axis. And then you have the H protein, which is here. And again, this can be seen in density at this point. And that probably makes the whole. Then once it goes through, you have this genome that enters. Now, whether it's a specific end of the genome like this, or whether it's pretty much anywhere on the genome where it goes in, that is much less clear. Um, whether that could be happening. It's not like in the MS2 or Cubeta, we really do see some nice electron density. You can say, okay, this exactly corresponds to one of the pieces of RNA, and since it's the same in all the different particles, that's why you see that it's got density there. Here it's not, not as obvious. So now we've got the genome on the inside. What do we need to do? We need to make a double strand. So this is just the DNA, and as I mentioned right at the beginning, all you need to do is put the DNA inside a cell, single-stranded DNA, and you will end up making virions. <clears throat> so it's all cellular proteins that are involved in this process. There is no viral protein whatsoever. But cellular proteins don't usually deal with single-stranded DNA, or do they? Where do cellular proteins deal with single-stranded DNA? Who's up next? Echo? Yeah. Where do cells have single-stranded DNA? Okay. Well, see, bacteria have single-stranded DNA, too. You need your virion. You need the virion up here. Echo needs a virion. <laughs> um, so when do you have single-stranded DNA? And, reg and just a regular cell. Yeah, forget virus infections. When are you going to have single-stranded DNA? One of them, go ahead. Exactly, when you're replicating. So the two strands have been pulled apart, right? How, what pulls the two strands apart? The helicase, exactly. And then you've got single-stranded binding protein that's going to associate with it. So that helicase, and what happens after you have helicase and pull the two strands apart? Hmm? Polymerase, one particular kind of polymerase. Give you a hint, all the genes are listed up here and it's right over there. Well, they also, well, the prime zone, which is, I always they love the zones. Our molecular biologists just love zones. But what we usually call this as an ACE, an enzyme. A, it's completely spacing, yeah? So DNA primase. So the DNA primase, as soon as you get those two strands pulled apart, DNA primase will sit down on it and then it will start and it will start to make an RNA primer, and that RNA primer is going to get extended, and you end up with double-stranded DNA. So the fact that you have single-stranded DNA coming in actually makes sense that you're going to have this, you know, you have a DNA primase that generally is going to recognize single-stranded DNA and start. So this is all cellular processes. Um, and there are a number of other um, proteins that are normally involved in replication initiation, DNA B, DNA C, et cetera and all the different primase subunits, but it's really the DNA primase, which will then give absolutely normal DNA replication, and you end up with double-stranded DNA. Um, and these are all, you know, first you have the primase, which makes an RNA primer, and then DNA polymerases, which will extend that and give you the whole rest of the genome. So now you have double-stranded DNA. What can you do with double-stranded DNA? You can make more double-stranded DNA, yes, which does happen. Um, what else is double-stranded DNA really good for? Go to the next person on the list. Crystal Pena. Yeah. What happens with double-stranded DNA? Um, what do you need to do next? <laughs> I need a signal for mRNA. You need to transcribe, exactly. <laughs> so transcription. How does transcription work? Well, transcription, you need promoters. Um, and these are what the transcripts actually look like. The black lines here represent the amount of transcript that you have for each of these um, pieces of the genome. P just represents promoters, so promoter for the A gene, promoter for the B gene, 
promoter for the D gene. Um, and you've got a ton of RNA starting at B, um, quite a lot starting at D, and less and less kind of throughout the genome. Why is this weird? Chris, why is this weird that you have, you know, a lot of transcript for B and D and less so for F and G in particular? Not so much. One of the things I forgot to mention is actually D is the protein which is the most common protein that you have inside the cell. And so for D, it actually kind of makes sense. You know, most common protein, you've got a bunch of RNA for it. But what about F, G, and H versus, you know, K, C, and um, E, and J? Yeah, they don't have the overlapping open reading frames, correct. Yeah, and those are because they are what? They are the proteins which are involved in the structure. Usually don't you need more of the structural proteins than you need of the non-structural proteins? Okay. Usually have need more, need more of the structural proteins than the non-structural proteins, right? So why would you have less RNA for your structural proteins and more RNA for the non-structural proteins? Seems a little bass backwards. It's exactly true, it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, but you do need a lot of the D protein, and you need a certain amount of the B protein. As I mentioned, this is the, one of those scaffolding proteins. But how you end up with the amounts of proteins for these different ones, um, partly it's transcription, but a lot of it also has to do with translation. And so translation, for instance, for the E gene, there's a really crummy ribosome binding site. Really crummy ribosome binding site, you're not going to get much translation that happens in that case. For E and H, um, codon usage is really bad. So codon usage, what's codon usage? I'm not gonna put anybody in the spot for this because I really didn't talk about it too much last term. But codon usage is if you use specific codons for which the host doesn't have very many tRNAs. So what it means is you have very slow translation of those because the, the ribosome's looking for the rare tRNAs that have them. So you actually end up with less of those proteins. So, <clears throat> The other thing is that the A protein transcript is very unstable. It gets chewed up, um, particularly actually starting at this end. So you have small amounts of the A protein, a bunch of B, a whole ton of D, and then translate a lot of the rest of them a lot less well. Um, and H is translated less well, and that's why you end up only with about 10 copies of H as opposed to the 60 copies that you have of F and G. So it's a real combination of both Transcription and translation, which gives you various amounts of protein. Yeah? What are the other two like Oh. Yeah, so each of these P, so P that's promoter for the A gene, promoter for the B gene, promoter for the D gene. And then these are terminators for each of those transcripts. So you know, terminator, which is at J, terminator is F, terminator is at G, and terminator at H. Um, and what this does mean is that you have more, you have more RNA for F and less RNA for G and even less RNA for H. And so just, just the amount of RNA, you would have less of those proteins. Um, but also above and beyond that, you've got the translational control that comes on top of that. Oh, does you have you have you have um, transcriptional termination that happens earlier? You don't seem to. So the the transcript. This, if you just look at transcripts, what you will see is you'll see the A transcript, and then from B you'll have a transcript that goes to here, some that goes to here, some that go to here, some that go to here, and for D some that go to here, some that go to here, and some that go to here. You know these termination points, you know, J is a termination point, F is a termination point, G is a termination point, H is a termination point. I forget whether these are row-dependent or row-independent terminators, where they make the hairpin loop, and you know, that's where you're going to have um, termination. So at a certain frequency, you'll have termination at each of these points. And by the time you get to the end, there's none left. Okay, so we have our proteins. We've got our double-stranded DNA. Now we need our single-stranded DNA in order to be able to package it. So how do you get single-stranded DNA. Well, we have our double-stranded DNA. Again, all of this is cellular proteins. Now we have our A protein. 
So that's that you know, non-structural protein, um, the one that I put the red line under earlier on, so I expect you to remember something about it. The A protein is actually a really fascinating protein. Um, it's, I like to call this a, so it's called the rep protein. What it does is it just cuts one strand of double-stranded DNA and then hooks its active site tyrosine to the 5' prime end when you mix that cut. So tyrosine is great for what reason? Got an OH. So basically it pretends it's an OH like a OH that you would have in a DNA backbone. So the tyrosine is bound to the OH. You have a 3', three prime OH. What happens if you have a 3', three prime OH? What happens with three, free three prime OHs? What do DNA polymerases love to do? Extend three prime OHs. So that's exactly what happens here. So you have a three prime OH, which is generated by the A protein, and then you have the DNA polymerase, which will start to try and replicate. Well, it could replicate fine, except it's going to run into this double stranded piece. But it turns out that the rep protein also has a helicase activity. So it starts to peel off this single strand. So your DNA polymerase will go along. The rep protein, which is bound to the 5' prime end, is now going to go all the way around the genome until it gets to the end. And actually what happens when it gets to here, it gets back to the part that it started at, and then it will re-ligate this single stranded piece and then bind to the five prime end right here. This three prime end will go, and it just keeps going and going and going, rotating around and around. This is also called rolling circle. So the DNA polymerase will just sit there and go round and round and round. Every time it gets round, the A protein will snip off one copy, ligate it, keep going around and around. So that's basically how you get your single strands. And that's that, you know, the only real you know, critical non-structural protein as far as how these microviruses work is that A protein. Because it will cut, will bind itself to the 5' prime end. As soon as it gets back to the place where it started, it will re-ligate it, and you can go around again. I mean, this generates all of the single-stranded pieces that you need, which will get packaged by the F protein, the G protein, the H protein, and put all of these things together. Okay, we happy on rolling circle replication? Are you ready to answer a clicker question on it? Yes? Okay. So, fire us back up again. Rolling circle replication in microvirus requires which viral protein? A, B, C, DNA polymerase 3, or rep? Ten. Not that you can't see it already. Five. What do we think? Oh, someone still thinks no. Oh, this is probably the person who's messing with me again and trying to get the wrong, not get the hundred percent. But yes, the A protein, um, which is involved in this. B protein is what? Scaffolding protein. We'll talk more about it in just a second. C protein. Have we talked about that at all? No. Um, DNA Paul 3 and REP are both cellular proteins, so they're not viral proteins. Okay, so we've got everything we need. We need to put it together. How does it come together? Now we finally get to talk about these uh, scaffolding proteins. So the B protein and the D protein. B protein, this is the one which you can mess around with completely because it's got overlapping open reading frames. The D protein is also very similar, so the white ones and the green ones here. F proteins, they form these pentamers. 
and then the G protein just sticks on top of that. To get this to work well and efficiently, you need the B protein, which allows these pentamers to form. These pentamers then bind to the D protein, which is an external scaffolding protein, and allows each of these pentamers to come together to form this, what's called the procapsid. Now, procapsid, you know, we've talked about capsids a whole bunch, but what's a procapsid? The procapsid is what you have before you have the final capsid. And the big reason for the procapsid is not so much the assembly process, but once you put together this particle, um, how's the DNA, how does the DNA come out? You have interaction with the G, and then you have the H protein that has this you know, crazy change in its structure. But somehow you've got to get the DNA in, in the first place. Where do you see DNA in this assembly? I don't see it at all. So it actually turns out that the procapsid is bigger than the final capsid structure, and bigger enough that it has holes right here at the threefold axis of symmetry. And it's through these holes that that single-stranded DNA gets stuffed into the capsid. So the procapsid is actually bigger than the final capsid. And you wouldn't necessarily think that you know, you're going to be making things that are you know, larger than the final process before you get to a smaller one. But this gets back to the whole idea of a metastable state. It's got to be really stable on the outside, but unstable when it finally gets to um, the place that it wants to be. So this is just a comparison of the procapsid. Again, it's got these holes right here. Um, and then once it becomes the final capsid, and this seems to be once you have the assembly of the nucleic acid on the inside, there's some kind of sensing where you then lose all of these external scaffolding proteins and finally form our native virion. So we've got all of our particles. Now we need to get outside the cell. Um, the E protein is the protein which is the lysis equivalent. So it turns out that the lysis for FIX174 works a lot like lysis for those RNA bacteriophage. Basically, blocking cross-linking of peptidoglycan. So as the cells keep trying to grow, they don't have a nice peptidoglycan, so they just end up exploding. Again, just like the RNA phage, um, and we'll see for a number of the other bacteriophages later on as well. <clears throat> Literally, the cell tries to grow, it's not properly cross-linked, and so the whole thing will fall apart. <clears throat> I'm going to spend the last couple of minutes talking about some of the fun other stuff that happens with PHIX-174. Uh, the first of these is a phylogeny by an excellent graduate student and then some PI who didn't really have a clue, um, who were looking at sequences that we found in an Acidicont lake in Lassen Volcanic National Park. And one of the things that we found there <clears throat> were all of these sequences that looked a lot like capsid protein sequences of these microviruses. So here's FIX-174 down here at the bottom, and up at the top are our Boiling Springs Lake um, BSL different sequences, which we found in, again, this Acidicot Lake environment. Um, these are actually quite closely related to some of these microviruses that infect the cells which like to grow inside other cells, so the whole you know, Russian doll process. Um, but the neat thing that Jeff found about this is that <clears throat> these proteins from these microviruses, these are present in an acidic hot lake. So what about acidic hot lakes is, is weird. A, you've got to be really stable. So your metastable state that you have already just when you're infecting E. coli at 37 degrees might not work terribly well if you're going to have to survive in a 50 degree plus lake and also at pH 2. So he found that the proteins, just through a modeling study, the proteins that are present on the outside of this capsid protein, and this is the F equivalent, now seem to form sort of a chain mail around the outside of the virus in order to make sure that it stays really stable under these extreme environments. So these are our predictions. Again, we, we found this a couple of years ago. But you can also see through this phylogeny 
that there are many, many, many others of these microviruses present in lots of different environments. So it's not just infecting E. coli. Now, we don't know if these all have H proteins that are forming these different kinds of structures. We don't know anything about the assembly processes of any of these, but probably are going to be pretty similar to each other. Oh, and this is that assembly process. Again, procapsid. Here, these things get stuffed in at the, the threefold axis um, of symmetry. And just to finish up, um, I mentioned that FIX174, first genome sequence to be done. The DNA works just by itself, and you can take store brought pieces of DNA, put them together, and actually get a complete virus. That was <clears throat> this study right here. These are all synthetic plaques formed by synthetic virions. Literally about 260 oligonucleotides, each about 40 nucleotides long, that were put together in a test tube, shaken up for two weeks. That's not exactly how they worked in the paper, but that's basically the idea is you can buy these short oligonucleotides and then as long as you design them properly, they'll overlap with each other. Put together a little bit of DNA polymerase. Those will make DNA, which you can end up using then to get infectious virus from. And so this is synthetic biology, beginnings of synthetic biology, et cetera. So those are our single-stranded DNA viruses. We'll start to get a little bit more bigger and complicated with T7 on Wednesday. And then review on Friday. Yeah, real quick question. Ruby runs away. Um, so with the specific lines for genes and binding proteins, yeah. are those packaged in the biointerior as well? Yeah, so the single stranded DNA binding proteins, those all seem to be cellular, but inside the virion you seem to have much less. Okay, we'll see you on Wednesday. Yeah, oh, that reminds me. Actually, so everybody, quick, before everybody leaves, um, clicker scores, I've got all of them, but somehow they're not attached to your name. Please just send me your clicker number. Just email it to me, and I'll add those by hand, because it's figuring out the rest of it's going to be a pain.